Why does I turn my mic on? I had to cough. Anyway, hello. So this is class today. This is Applied Digital Studies Section 2, kicking things off around 2.50, and we'll be going, well, a little late actually, sorry about that. Um, and we're going to be going to about 3.30. Um, and that should, probably won't go over that today, we'll see, but I certainly don't plan to. Uh, sorry, getting everything kind of situated and put back together here. Um, but I hope you all are doing well. Let's see, I've got 10 viewers of shows on Twitch, maybe a little bit more. Sometimes that's out of date uh, a little bit, but in lots of people online on Discord. So if you don't mind, say hello. That would be great to kind of hear who's out there. I see Brandon on Twitch. Um, but anyone else, uh, always good to see that I have that I have an audience or know that I have an audience. I mean, I, I trust that I do, but it's kind of helpful to see who that is. So thank you for saying hello, Lillian and Ryan and Becca. Uh, good to see you all. Hopefully there's a few more than you all, just you all here, um, but that's okay. This is of course being recorded and so on. Um, all right, so today being Friday, this is the end of the first week. It's a, a sunny day, but pretty cold from what I understand. Um, I have not been able to make it outside yet. Uh, there's Mary on Twitch, and there's Colin. Colin, you, you aren't even in this class. <laughs> That's all right. 
you can watch anyway it's fine um the uh yeah it's a nice day and looks like it's going to be an interesting weekend in terms of weather i'm not sure what's um going to happen with the snow last i checked it's like like i'm looking on weather underground which is my my weather forecast of choice and it looks like it's going to be one of those weekends where it's like right on the line between snow and rain so it could be you know a lot of one or a lot of the other and um you know a little bit of rain if it's cold enough turns into a lot of snow so i don't know it looks like it might actually start snowing it would be like um early sunday morning is, is, is what it's looking at as far as starting but yeah looking at weather underground right now it says uh, 5.2 inches on sunday and then another three on monday so that's interesting um the <laughs> it could be an interesting weekend if you're if you're moving in this weekend uh, hopefully you can get in Saturday. I don't know how the, the, the timing all for all that works, but hopefully that hopefully that goes okay. Um, okay, so today is a live stream, and I want to do I want to talk about a few things, different things um, on here, and I've got some slides to help remind me of what to talk about. Sorry, I'm gonna get my other window pulled up here. Um, so, yeah, oh, Colin, yeah, there has been some bird feeder action yesterday. I got a uh, uh, it was I got some video you can look on the twitch videos um, in the downloadable videos on twitch there's nobody there now but um, it uh, there was a, a female cardinal and a, either a sparrow or a warbler we're not sure because um, they look similar I think it's a sparrow but my daughter insists that it was a yellow warbler but I don't know but it was um, there too and they were both hopping around together it's kind of cute so check it out <laughs> uh, a six minute six minute video of birds eating so <laughs> You know, pretty exciting. I was excited anyway. Um, so today, yeah, like I said, we're going to go through some things here. Just a, a quick um, commercial, actually, not commercial, but something I did want to mention because it was exciting. and I, uh, Something I got to do last night. It's pretty exciting. Um, I want to make sure you know about this opportunity to do this interesting thing as well. Uh, this is a location in Fredericksburg. It's called Reclaim Arcade. It's a side venture, um, I guess, business by... Uh, Reclaim Hosting, that's the company that does web hosting for UMW domains and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, they're based in Fredericksburg and they, as a side venture, they've created this space called Reclaim Arcade, which is pretty cool and you should check it out if you live in Fredericksburg or if you're on, you know, when you come to campus. It's um, it's an old school cart, uh, arcade, a retro style arcade. They've got about 57, or last night they had 57 working uh, uh, cabinets uh, set up and they had uh, and they have about eight or nine pinball machines um, really cool stuff um, it's a uh, they open today like today's their soft opening basically um, I think they're all booked up today and for the first few days but they have a reservation system so you have to book a two-hour time slot and then everything is set to free to play uh, set to free play while you're there um, eventually they're gonna have food and stuff they have like snacks you can buy like Twizzlers and chips and stuff right now but eventually they're gonna do like a full service food place too in there I think uh, but they're, they're just kind of for for now and for the next few months it'll just be come and play some games um, but yeah I got a chance to check it out last night and very exciting um, you walk in through the reclaim video store which is kind of another project of theirs but it's um, basically a VHS rental store so if you have a VCR and you want to watch a movie on tape you can rent a tape from them and watch that um, I, I understand not a lot of people do that but it's there in case you want to uh, they have, as you can see from this image here, they have a lot of like old horror movies. Um, you can also watch that movie in the console living room. You can see, you kind of see, they have a VCR there, um, but they have a VCR hooked up to a TV, a bunch of other cool stuff there. Uh, and this was their, this is a project that they've created as a, um, it's kind of the sequel to a project that we created a few years ago at UMW. So um, the two owners of Reclaim are Jim Groom and Tim Owens. And me and Jim Groom, a few years ago, we created this space called the console living room on the fourth floor of the Convergence Center. And it was kind of like you see over here, but set up in the Convergence Center. It was an 80s, 1980s or 70s style living room space with a bunch of media in it and consoles and stuff you could play with. And we had to take it down. It became something else for a while, uh, sort of a 90s version. And then it became sort of just stuff that was over there. And now now it's all, it's all put in storage. But the um, parts of it are still uh, still alive over there in, in Reclaim Arcade, so check it out. Lots of games, you know, really some interesting, some, some classics, some kind of obscure games, a couple of kind of rare games. So they've really got a lot of great stuff to check out. Um, they've, uh, they've got like, 
you know, the Galaga and Gal Galaxian, as you can see in the picture here, um, they got a bunch of fighting games. Um, my son was, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, pretty interested in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> and so we spent some time playing Mortal Kombat together. And uh, <laughs> I forget, you forget how violent, I mean, obviously that game is super violent, but like you forget just how ridiculous it is until you play it. Um, they've, they've got Tron, they've got Battle Zone, they've got Tempest. Tempest is probably my favorite that they have. Um, Man, they, they just got a lot. So check it out. Some really good pinball games too. I'm not as in, like I don't know as much about the pinball game history, um, but arcade game history. I can I can go for a while telling you about arcade game history. But um, pinball machines, they got a few that are really cool. And they have one. I don't know if it's hooked up at the moment because they have to actually hook it up. But let me see. Actually, I can check. They have a pinball game you can play over the internet, and you don't have to pay for it or anything. You just but they have to have the camera hooked up to it. But oh yeah, okay, it's offline right now. But when they have it hooked up, you can go to this website that I'm looking at right now and you can play their pinball machine. Um, like you see what you see a camera pointed at the surface of the pinball machine and then you, your keyboard, you can control the paddles and, and play the game. It's pretty interesting. So anyway, we claim arcade, local business. Um, and whenever things open up a lot more, uh, then I imagine they will be fairly popular. So check it out. Anyway, so it was my little commercial. Um, they are friends of mine, but I don't get any kind of endorsement for recommending them to you. I just thought you should know about it because it's pretty awesome and, and it's uh, in Fredericksburg. Um, okay, so let's talk about today. So um, what, we, what we're basically covering this week is just kind of common denominators and starting points and logistics. So um, going forward, uh, I, I want to kind of get, prepare you for a couple of things and um, just kind of set up a proposal for how to go about our schedule starting with next week. So next week will be our first like regularly scheduled hybrid week. So let me talk a little bit about this. Um, so Discord is always gonna be the common denominator. So whatever modality, whatever online format, um, you should always kind of start with Discord and be online at 250 in your all's case for your section. I mean, it's the kind of thing you, I like, I leave open all the time anyway in the background. Um, you could do that too if you want, but definitely be online at 250 and Discord. Um, that's just the common denominator. Uh, I'm also I'm going through the process of putting you all into roles based on which section you're in, which will make it easier for me to address each section independently. So I could say at section two, blah blah blah, or at section one, blah blah blah. Um, so I I got about halfway through doing that last night. I kept falling asleep, so I'm I apologize. I haven't done that yet, and it looks like actually I'm skimming it. I think I have some of you in the wrong section. As I said, I kept I'd be working for a while, and then I'd wake up, and it was ten minutes later because I kept like my head kept falling over. Anyway. Um, I'll, I'll work on that and that'll make it easier for you to identify who's in whichever cohort. Um, they may be other, there may be some other cohorts uh, based on how we organize ourselves, but but maybe not. Uh, maybe this this might be it. Uh, we kind of, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm still working on giving you the content for the next week. We will have topics, we will have structure, we will have content, but I'm kind of working my way towards that. Still kind of recovering from the winter term and just kind of all the stuff that always happens in the first week of classes. So. Um, which is basically just hours and hours of emails. <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting there, but I'm not quite ready to show you week one yet. Um, but I will be on Monday. So there's no homework between now and then. It's just gonna, you're just gonna have to bear with me on, as I get things together. But I assume it's okay that you don't have homework this weekend. Um, okay, so I do have a plan to propose. I have a feeling I already know the answer to how you all are distributed. Those of you who are on the Zoom call on Wednesday, had a, you did give me feedback or give me a sense of your intentions with regard to in-person versus fully online. So, but I, I wanna pose it again, just in case you've changed your mind, but just to also kind of confirm um, what I think is your intentions. I'm gonna post a message here in Discord, and this message is, I'm gonna to respond to it with two specific emoji, and then invite you to click on whichever emoji corresponds to your answer. So this is gonna be, are you planning to, con to complete this class fully online, or do you want to attend class face-to-face -face when possible. All right, so I've, I've just posted the message there and I'm gonna add the first reactions to it. So, let me see. Yeah, so just click on whichever of those corresponds to your plan. So click on the building for face-to-face -face or the laptop for fully online. And if you're not in, tw in Discord, like if you're only on Twitch and it's hard to switch back and forth, you can just type your uh, message on the in Twitch and I'll see it there too. Yeah, so I've seen, seen a couple of votes, but yeah, more people, more than two people online. So 
Indicate your choice. There we go. They're starting to come in. <coughs> this is not binding. This isn't a commitment. This is just another straw poll just to kind of see where everyone is with this. And it looks like the numbers are so far basically the same as they were in Zoom the other day. And I do have a vote from Twitch for in person. So I see that, Mary. Which is, yeah, that's about what it was before. Still missing a bunch of people. I know people are online, but I don't know if they're. Like, maybe you're on the fence, and that's okay. If you're, if you're not ready to, to indicate a strong preference either way yet, that's okay. But like. Yeah, and also the way this works, I don't think I can. Well, actually, no, I can't see. Who, I can indeed see who's voted either way. So, yeah. All right. That's fine. Let's see. Yeah, Emily, or I'm trying to see if there's anyone who's online who hasn't voted yet. I think Emily may not have. Emilia. Emilia. Well, okay, I'm not gonna nag you about it, but there it is. Um, just to give you that that vote, uh, yeah, no, it's all right. I saw your vote, Brandon. I think, yeah. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is here's the plan. Okay, um, this is my plan. It's going to be, um, you know, this being a hybrid class, I think it makes sense given just the balance of where the votes are to think of this as a majority online class. So this is gonna be. Um, online synchronous on Mondays, online synchronous on Fridays, and then um, optional face-to-face -face class on Wednesday. So uh, what I think I'll do is see if there's something in Canvas I can do that works kind of like Sign Up Genius, or maybe I'll do, just do Sign Up Genius, where people that want to attend on a given Wednesday can sign up ahead of time and say they plan on coming. That's, that way I'll know who's coming. And also I'll know like if no one's coming, I won't come either. So I like, guess the kind of thing that we might be able to, to be flexible about. Um, but we'll start the system this week, so I'll have something set up by Monday to, to give you a chance to sign up and say, yes, I plan to come face to face on Wednesday. Um, and that'll be, you know, that, that won't be binding going forward, it'll just be a week by week commitment. And that may evolve or you may change your mind after time, you know, after things, you know, progress. It, it's something that I imagine we'll need to be flexible with. Um, so that's the basic idea. Um, any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, thanks Pikachu. Pikachu's heart. I don't remember your actual name, but thanks, Pikachu's heart. That's how you do it. Um, you were in the other section, though, weren't you, Pikachu? Aren't you in section one? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyone's welcome to watch, whichever. Um, cool. Okay. Just seeing some emails coming through there. I'm trying to wrap up. Like internships and individual individual studies are all due today, so people are like freaking out. But it's all gonna be fine. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to talk about a couple of things today uh, now that we've got a sense of the schedule going forward. Uh, again, much more to come, but I've got a sense that many of you intend to complete things online and that's all right. So um, I wanted to talk, think back to the first day when I laid out the initial goals of the class and the big picture of the class and continue giving, some, giving you some ways to think about this and actually want to introduce one of the features of this class or one of the tools that we're going to be using a lot in this class. Um, so remember there's the big three right digital creativity digital culture digital methodology i think digital creativity is pretty intuitive like being creative with digital media but uh, methodology and culture may be a little bit harder to get your head around and one way that we're going to be doing methodology is going to be with writing code and learning a bit of programming and so i wanted to show you the tool that we're going to use to do that and invite you to start looking at it um, this is not going to be a very detailed tutorial other than just to explain what it is and show you how parts of it work um, and I invite you to follow along, or you can do this later if you want. You might want to just take notes on what I'm doing and look at it later. Um, if you get, like, this isn't going to be very de a very detailed tutorial anyway, but um, sometimes with a tutorial, like, if you get off a step, it can be kind of confusing to get back on a step, or if you try something out and then it doesn't work, and then, you know, it, we can get out of sync and that could, could be confusing. So you might be better off just sort of watching and then uh, playing it back later if you, if you want to follow along. Um, of course, you can just try it and see how it goes. Um, so the uh, hold a second. One. Uh, okay, sorry, I just saw a question from Amelia. Um, okay, gl glad you're learning. That looks good. You're good. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll type a response to you later, but thank you. Um, the um, 
Okay, so digital methodology, again, it's, so the basic idea of digital methodology is that we're using digital tools like programming to explore ideas and answer questions, solve problems in some cases, but I'm really interested in the idea of exploration, uh, writing some code to look at a situation or a problem or try to investigate a question can give us a sense of it that's really uh, unique and can be a lot deeper or a lot more interesting or rich than just like watching a slideshow about something or watching a movie or reading a paper about it. Um, but actually writing some code to try out some different ideas to see what happens, that can really be an interesting way to explore all kinds of things, um, especially things that are algorithmically oriented, which is what our first module is gonna be focusing on. Um, so to do that, we need to understand a little bit about how code works. And before we can do that, we need to have a place where we can write some code and see what happens when we write that code. So let's take a look at an example of how this, you know, a place where we can do this. Uh, in fact, I've already got this something set up, but I want to actually give you the entry point instead of taking you there. Um, so what we're going to be using is a system called Collabor Collaboratory Notebooks, or just Collab Notebooks for short. This is a service that's hosted on Google, and I'm going to give you the link in Discord in case you want to try it. Maybe. Um, actually, that's that's like a Google processed link. That'll probably work, but let me give you the shorter version of that because that's probably easier to see and, and to remember. Um, and actually, it worked for, for Discord as far as pulling in the uh, thumbnail. So um, you can click that and open it if you'd like. I'm going to do that. If you want to just watch me do it, that's totally fine. So let's take a look. Um, when you first start it, it's going to look like this. And you probably need to start it this way first to begin with. Um, it is an app that's added to your Google Drive, um, so it's built inside the Google ecosystem. So in order for that to work, you do need to have a Google account. If you don't already have an account and you want to make it later, that's fine. Just watch me for right now. Um, this is uh, it's a system kind of built on top of Google Drive. I don't remember the exact history of this product, but it was not created. I don't believe it was created by Google to begin with. I think it was a third party thing that has become more integrated with the Google file ecosystem, but it still sits somewhat apart from the Google Drive file system, as you'll see in a moment. So what we're going to be creating is a kind of thing called a notebook. And a notebook is a rich document that can contain all kinds of things, but especially it can contain content like images and text, and it can contain code that can run and execute. And that's the big thing that makes this unique. So we're not, this is a programming environment. It is an IDE, an integrated development environment. But what's really cool about a notebook is that you can embed that development work, that, that programming work with text. So essentially you can write essays that have working bits of code embedded in them to help you prove a point, for example. That's something I've done. Um, and I'll show you some examples. Actually, maybe I'll show you an example of a complete notebook first and then show you how, to, how I would go about making one. And then, you know, again, this is all gonna feel a little weird at first if you've never seen this kind of thing. My, my goal is to try to introduce it to you kind of um, little by little and understand that you'll kind of pick it up little by little. Um, this is an example of a complete uh, collab notebook. I did not write this one. Someone else, someone else wrote this one and it's basically a tutorial. And the way that I interacted with this is I made a copy for myself so that I can edit it and change different parts of it. And I would read this instructions here and then I'd run this code, read something, run this code, read something, run the code. And so it's a tutorial, but I'm really just sort of reading and understanding and then executing the code and hopefully it does what I expect it to. Um, so actually I didn't write any of this code, I just, I ran it. Um, this is a pretty frequent or pretty common use for collab notebooks. If you write a collab notebook like this, it makes it easy to package up your ideas or your processes and let someone else try it out. Um, in this case, I'm trying to train artificial intelligence that can create music. And um, I'm trying to train it on a speech given by a uh, computer that controls the world from the movie, uh, the 1970 movie Colossus, the Forbin Project. You know, so just a, one of the strange things I do, not a big deal, not that important. The point is that what we see here are two kinds of content. We have code that runs right here, and then we have text that I can read right here. So running code, reading text are the two things that happen in a, in a Colab notebook. Um, the idea of notebooks, there are other kinds of notebooks. In fact, Colab notebooks is a more recent kind of thing. Uh, there's something called an IPython notebook or a Jupyter notebook or Azure notebooks. Uh, there, there's actually lots of different notebook platforms. And the thing I like about Colab notebooks is that they are embedded into Google in the sense that you can create them from your Google Drive. And that's really convenient. Um, you also don't have to download anything like or run a notebook server on your own computer. You're going to run it on Google server uh, for free. So that's, that's a really convenient thing as well. So that's the, that really is the main thing. 
Um, I will say Azure Notebooks are actually also free um, and they run in the cloud, but they're a little bit wonkier to get into. Um, they actually integrate with the Microsoft 365 or whatever that's called, the Office, out, whatever the thing is that our email runs on, <laughs> that Microsoft thing. It actually, you can hook Azure Notebooks into that, but basically it's, it's, it's kind of tedious. So I, I, I find Colab Notebooks easier, so that's why I like to work with them. So let me show you how to do this. I want to make a new notebook. As you can see there, the words are new notebook and it will look like this. I'm gonna explain a lot about the interface before I actually get, get, get to any code. So um, let me see, maybe I can actually sort of point to different parts of it with my green screen. Okay, so the main part of it, as you can see, is um, this part here, and my finger's getting cut off, but the main part of there is, is where you would write the content. And this is where, um, actually, you know what I can do? Let me be, look at me go up here. So right, right here where it says plus code and plus text, that's how you create the two different types of cells. This is a cell right here where you have the, you see the number one and the play button next to it. Um, that's where I can write some code and you start off with that. But like I said, there's two kinds of, um, two kinds of content and text is probably a more intuitive place to start. Um, these cells can be moved up and down. It doesn't really matter what order they appear in. Um, but if I wanna write this part here as text, I just can double click and then I can write some text here. And in the kind of use case of Colab Notebooks, the convention is that you hit Shift Enter to save something you've done or to enter it or to run it if it's code. So I'm gonna hit Shift Enter. You can't see me physically do that, but that's what I just did. And now I've got some text that's part of this notebook. Okay, so that's the main, whoops, that's the main way of adding text, but I can do a lot more. I'm gonna move myself back down here in case you all are, are typing above me. And the other, you will often find yourself doing other things with this, right? It's not just text, but you can do formatted text. Uh, for example, when I give you a notebook, I will probably structure it with headings. And you can write headings here if you use a little, a little bit of syntax called markdown. And you can do that, let's say if I wanna make this a top level heading, I can put one hash mark in front of it and then it becomes like big. Um, but it's not just big, it's actually occupying an outline level. Um, so it's, if I write underneath it, uh, put another cell under it, um, you can see that that's just a paragraph, but what's cool is that it, this gets added to a table of contents for this notebook. So if I click on this thing on the left, um, it's hard to see with just one, but it's actually um, gonna be broken down into sections. In fact, this one, if it's written that way, might have that. Yeah, this one kind of has it, um, where you've got different sections you can jump to if you want to from the table of contents. And that's really helpful as, as these get long uh, to have that feature. Okay, so where am I? I heard Discord being, was there a question? Uh, no, that was from a different Discord. Okay, so the uh, so this is it. So far, I'm just writing text and I'm, I'm putting it in here. Um, I you know it, you might have noticed a few things that are are familiar if you've used Google Docs and it has many of those features, um, pretty much the same. Um, like and I'll just take myself on a ride here, right? So up here you've got the uh, this is what I've never done this before. You've got the title uh, and this is just like in a Google Doc. You can click on that to edit it and make it something else. Um, these should, by convention, end with P, Y, and B like that. Um, that is to make them interoperable so that if you download this for some reason you could, and you wanted to run it in a Jupyter notebook, it would probably still work because it has that file extension. And ultimately, this is a specific document format that contains um, content sections and code sections, but uh, that's a little bit technical. The point is just like you can rename it. Um, you can also... I'm going another ride here. You can also, uh, you can leave comments on it cell by cell. Um, you can also share this just like you would a, uh, like a normal Google Doc. So sometimes when you are completing work in a Google Doc, I mean, in a Colab notebook, and I ask you to share it with me, you would share it with me using this, this interface, which is what you would normally do like for uh, sharing a slideshow or something like that. It's the same, same sharing API, works the same way. Okay, let me go back over here. <laughs> That's fine. I don't know. What, I, don't know I, should, I should do that more often. That's fine. Um, okay, so Brandon has asked a question on Twitch. Are there manual commands or options, or does it software rely heavily on shortcuts? Um, yeah, there are, there are menu commands from just about everything. So, like, if you go up here, there's actually quite a few things here that are, you know, unique to things, um, to this. Uh, yeah, a lot of it works in the code version and not in the text kind of cell, which is what I'm in right now. But um, yeah, but that basic shift enter, that's really the only keyboard convention that I, I can think of. Uh, pretty much everything else, and you don't even have to do that. It's just, I find that easy. So like usually, I think if you click here, 
and then you click into another cell, it'll automatically just save and run that. Um, I, I think I don't know if it'll run a cell code unless you actually hit the play button though. I don't know, we'll find out in a moment. Uh, okay, so that's the basic interface. And so the other thing that I wanted to show you is over here on the left. And let me, let me go on a right again, because this is important. So right here, you see this little icon that looks like a folder. When you click on that, that's going to make it possible to access the file storage area inside of this notebook. Um, it tells me I can't use it yet because I need to connect to a runtime. And actually it is, it looks like it did just connect to a runtime for me. Um, but uh, now that it is connected, I have a temporary file storage area and temporary is important. That means it's not gonna last, which means after a couple hours, after I stop working on this notebook, it's gonna disappear, it's gonna reset. This is a temporary storage area. You can connect it to a Google Drive folder. I'm not gonna do that right now, because um, it takes a few minutes, but, um, or a minute or two, but it's not, and it's not important right now. Uh, but that's something that you can do. The, uh, usually though, you would just upload a file. Um, this is something called poema.txt, and I don't know what it is. I don't remember, but that's a file that I could use if I were, if I needed something, if I needed a file for, for whatever project I was working on. Um, yeah, the other thing I guess worth mentioning is the, let's see, where am I in my floating um, journey here? Whoa. Uh, over here, you can see where it says RAM and disk. That's telling me about the computer that I'm using right now. Because what happens when you connect to a runtime is you are connecting to a computer that lives in a Google server farm somewhere. And that's the computer that's going to run the code that I write in this notebook. Um, usually with a, with Python notebooks, uh, like Jupyter notebooks, you would be running it on your own, on a server on your own computer, but now we're running it on a server on Google and that's for free. Um, I have, you see, I have the Colab, you can see cause I have this icon right here. I have the Google Colab Pro account right now. Um, I just have that temporarily. I'm not planning to keep it. It's $9 a month. Um, and it's a pretty good deal for the amount of computing they give you access to. I was able to do some pretty heavy AI stuff with it, but um, it's, it's like not something I always need, so I'll, I'll probably uh, cancel it pretty soon once I get finished with this one project. Um, so, okay, so let me show you a little bit of code. The, there are a couple of different things that might look different when you use it for the first time. Um, in the, you can choose different settings in the editor. I just clicked on the gear icon. And I, I do like to show line numbers. So that, that just makes it easier for me to read and share, but you may not have that checked by default. Um, don't worry about that. I'm just explaining why there's a one here because that's actually line one and if I hit enter a bunch of times You can see I get line numbers But this is code and this is expecting me to write some Python code so I can write some Python code here Let's just do ask it to print something. Let's just do a little math And now this is code so I, I run this code by hitting the play button and if it works then it should complete the command that I typed here which is I told it to print uh, whatever the answer to this question was. So I told it to evaluate this. Uh, Python understood, hey, that's math. I know math. It did the math, and then it printed the answer there as a result. Don't worry about that part of it. That's that's the actual programming part of it, but that's that's where I wanted you to see that that's different. Like right here, I wrote something, and then I see what I wrote. Here I wrote something that was a special set of instructions to a computer, and the computer followed those instructions and printed, at, printed back to me what I told it to print back to me. So that's the difference between those two modalities. So, yeah, Colab Notebooks. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you know, certainly feel free to type them, but don't worry too much about this if this seems a little weird and overwhelming right now. Um, I'm, we're, we're going to continue looking at this. I'm gonna be giving you more things in this format. Uh, I'm just kind of trying to start planting some seed right now, basically, in terms of this. All right, cool. So um, there is one other topic I wanted to bring up today and um, I hope that's all right, um, which is to reference what the image that you saw in the lobby, like in the, the, the onboarding screen before I started talking. Um, and you know, this class, we will employ digital methodologies and you are encouraged to as you prepare your final project. But I also think we should acknowledge and talk about and understand digital culture. And digital culture can be kind of confusing because it sort of seems like it could be everything or it could be nothing because everything's digital anyway because it's on a computer now right, or, or maybe not. Um, but I think there are certainly things going on in the world right now that are only going on because of specific digital platforms and digital moments. And uh, there's something going on right now that I think is worth, worth mentioning. Um, there's a podcast I listen to called Reply All, and they sometimes do a segment called Yes, Yes, No, where they uh, present one of the hosts with a tweet and then they ask that host, do you understand this tweet? And 
The whole segment is kind of a reference to the fact that often internet culture, especially Twitter, can be full of multi-layered memes and context and inside jokes and references, and it can kind of be hard. It can be hard to disentangle. Um, but there's something going on right now that this um, first artifact uh, has a lot to say about. So here's a tweet, and so we're kind of playing yes, yes, no here. Um, if we were the host, if I were the host of this podcast, I would present this, present this tweet to you and ask you, do you understand this? Um, so I'm posing this question to you. If you're watching, um, you can type your answers in Discord or Twitch. Do you understand this tweet? This isn't really a test or anything. This is just sort of, you know, how do we start? This is more like a, a something to start the conversation about it. And as, as Ben says, unfortunately, yes. That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, say more if you can uh, of what you understand about this. Because yes, I, I feel the same way, Ben. I sort of regret that I and I know I know what's going on here. Okay, great. So we got two no's. All right, this is yes yes no no or yes no 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 so far. All right, great. Um, that's fine. All right, well, Ben, you if you have if you feel at all confident in your explanation, go ahead uh, and share your thoughts. But I'll I'll give you my my version as well. Um, okay, so lots of things to unpack about this tweet, like as is always the case. So. First of all, who's tweeting? Like, who is the messenger here? Uh, this is Elon Musk. Elon Musk is an entrepreneur, um, tech op entrepreneur, um, Tesla. You know, um, he's that guy. He's the he's the Tesla guy. Um, often, I've well, okay, I have a lot of I have several rants about Elon Musk, but I'm going to save those for now. But Elon Musk is a, is someone that is known, and as Ben is pointing out in there, um, stonk is a joke term for stocks, and it's a meme. So you talk about stonks instead of stocks it's a way of kind of the joke is sort of like i don't really know what i'm doing i'm just playing with stocks um so i'm just calling them stonks dude dude and it's usually included with images of that like weird head that i showed that was showing it as i started the stream today um kind of like saying i don't really understand stocks but so we'll call them stonks um so the uh oh so brandon i see is saying yes on twitch too yeah, I don't think I have any surprises. I think I'm still struggling with this too. All right, so that's stonks, or stock, or you know, stonk. <laughs> stonk is is a meme, a joke term for stock, and uh, of course, stocks like you would trade on the Wall on the Dow Jones, right, down or Nasdaq or, or you know Wall Street, that kind of stock. Okay, so uh, game stonk. So let me show you. Let me, I'm going to have to type this to make it more clear. Games Stonk is a portmanteau of uh, GameStop, which is the company. Uh, GameStop is the retailer that sells video games and other stuff. Um, and so they are at the center of this story that is being referenced here. And so Elon Musk tweeting Game Stonk is telling us, or telling us, well, I don't know what he's telling us, but many people saw this as an endorsement of what's been going on with GameStop stocks this week. Um, so I am not going to be able to tell you much else about what's actually going on in the stock market because I don't really understand it. Um, but it appears that, I mean, there are several kind of high level takeaways that I do get. I just don't really get the mechanics of how this is actually working. But um, there is a reference here. It says the link that he's linking to is to a subreddit so a subreddit is a forum on the website Reddit, and the, you can Reddit is divided into thousands of subreddits. There's one called Wall Street Bets, and I guess what they do is sort of talk about mostly like penny stock trading and other kinds of like really risky speculative trading, and they basically turn trading stock trading into kind of a game or a meme. And um, what has happened, I, if I and this is my layman's terms explanation, which is probably wrong in certain ways, is that from what I gather, and Ben, feel free to add any to this or, or Brandon, if you think you can explain it better than me, but on the stock market, most people are buying stock because they expect the stock to increase in value. So it's kind of a bet that this is a good company to invest in. That's how most people invest on the stock market. There are uh, hedge funds and other large funds, however, that bet on the opposite they actually bet on a stock to fail so they they're saying that i think this price is going down and they've got a bunch of money 
behind that assumption that a particular stock price is going to fall. So it does seem that, yeah, and Ben's got the, the ultimate takeaway. Yeah, and it does seem that when people on the subreddit decided that um, the, the short sellers, those are the people expecting the stock to fall, they recognized that that was happening and they said, let's drive the stock price up by buying a bunch of it. Then that ends up causing the people who own a short position on GameStop to lose a ton of money. And I don't know the exact numbers. I don't like, I don't know how that 70 billion is calculated, but I've seen that people saying that um, the amount of losses in hedge funds uh, was like $70 billion this week. Uh, and I don't know, like to me, stock price money always feels like pretend money. Like, I don't know if that's real money. I don't know if that means that that money has to come from somewhere else. I don't really understand that. Um, and I don't really understand how short selling works. I mean, people have explained it to me and I've watched videos, but I'm still like, I'm still not really getting the basics of it, I feel like. But uh, I mean, the mechanics of it, like I get the basics, but I don't get the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but yeah, so that's right. And so Ben's summary is like Wall Street had, so the hedge funds, they'd already sold their stock and then they had to buy it back. And that's the part I don't really get is like, is short selling a I guess it's a commitment that you'll buy it back later, no matter what the price is. And so you're assuming it's gonna go down, so you'll buy it back for cheaper. But in fact, when it goes way up, you end up having to spend a ton of money to buy it back, which you've already committed to because of the short selling arrangement, which that's that's the part I don't get. Like who who insists on that? Like what is, why is that necessary? Anyway, the whole event seems to be a kind of sticking it to the 1% kind of moments where people are um, there's a there's a lot of like internet populism going on where people are super excited about trying to do damage to uh, Wall Street, and that's the kind of energy that is kind of exciting. It's kind of fun to see it. Um, at the same time, it's one of these things. It's like I've seen internet populism go really really bad before, um, and so I that's why I'm a little worried about this too. It's kind of exciting, and you know, as Brandon points out, David the David versus Goliath narrative that is really fun. Um, but if you look at it, like a lot of the like the language, a lot of the memes, they're also really toxic, like you know, you know, slurs and racism, like the normal kinds of junk that you normally see on like 4chan kinds of internet are kind of showing up in the conversations around Wall Street bets. And I don't think that's I don't, I'm not that's not an indictment of the whole subreddit or the whole idea anyway. Uh, the the point is just like you never know what you're gonna get with this when this kind of energy shows up, and sometimes it can be really harmful. It seems like so far it's being kind of used in the in the service of good. Like I, I can get behind that, but you always kind of wonder. And this is the kind of thing when we study digital culture that we, we start to look for. It's like, you know, where does this come from? Where does this go? And uh, you know, that's what we're thinking about with digital culture here. And when we ask, when I say that this class includes digital culture, this is the kind of thing that we're trying to understand. Not just the wall, not the Wall Street part of it, but the Reddit part of it, or the 4chan part of it, or wherever this originated. Like, where did that come from? Like who decided this would be a thing and then why did it become a thing? And then how do we you know, understand it from that point of view? So I don't know, I don't know where it goes, but it's interesting to watch and it seems like it's all over the news and um, all the podcasts I listen to are talking about it. Seems like a big deal, um, especially if as it's true, if it's true that the $70 billion, you know, like that's still a thing. Um, oh, actually, let's check it out. You can go to marketwatch.com and Look at stock prices. Um, the other side of the narrative is that it seems that certain traders like Ameritrade and um, Robinhood and others are like actually preventing people from buying shares because they feel like they're driving up the stock price art artificially or the SEC is looking into it. But yeah, their, their price is still way up. So 305. So like, I don't know, this is getting a little bit into the structures of it, but you can kind of see what happened here on the stock price. So. Like for most of the year, it's in, it's been, you know, in the 16, 15, 13, you know, pretty cheap. And then all of a sudden it's almost $400. <laughs> so that, that's an incredible surge. Like you never see things like that happen unless there's some kind of external pressure, which in this case was a bunch of basically trolls on Reddit. So it's pretty fascinating and pretty interesting to see what's gonna happen with that. Okay, I do have one more artifact, but I know I'm over time. So I'm just gonna show it to you and then see if you can well, I'll just show it to you and share a couple of thoughts maybe, but um, if you need to go, that's fine. This is uh, an image, and this is an image from a TV show. And I, this is the other artifact that I was going to ask you if you know what this is. 
Um, this is, if you're looking at it, it's obviously a watch. It's a Strucker watch. There is a um, mysterious logo below the hours hands in the center there. Um, and this is an image that ha people has had some people talking uh, over the past really two or three weeks, right? So, okay, Lillian's got it, great. Um, so if you want to, you can explain it if you want to put it in your own words, but basically this is a, an image from the TV show WandaVision. And even though that's a TV show, and so we should think of it as like an example of TV media, and it is, um, it's what I would call prestige TV. So it's like kind of got a highbrow sentiment to it. And it's like, oh, we have to understand the inside parts of this. I really get it. Um, it's meant to be kind of uh, intellectual, I think. Um, it's also an example of complex TV, which is a special term of art cre created by uh, TV scholars, people who study this stuff, which means like uh, when we watch it, we're not just being entertained. We're um, being asked to figure things out and solve a puzzle. And this particular watch might be a huge clue. And so I offer this as an example of how even watching TV, something like WandaVision, it's not just watching TV. It's not just an isolated artifact that exists inside of a TV universe. Um, it's actually this thing with this life beyond that. And the real life of the TV show isn't what you can watch on Disney Plus. It's what you can talk about on Twitter or talk about on the subreddit or talk about with your family or whatever. Um, it's this idea that there is a puzzle here that no single individual has enough information to solve by themselves. So we turn to wikis and Twitter threads uh, to try to understand what this is, offering different theories and different evidence, pieces of, pieces of evidence that add up to what we think might actually be going on on this TV show. And, and so this watch was a particularly troublesome clue, and I don't want to spoil anything, but um, it does seem like a, an artifact of Hydra, which was the kind of um, crypto fascist organization in the Marvel Universe. So uh, kind, of a, kind of the placeholder for Nazis, but also literally Nazis. Uh, so this is... Um, Kind of odd that it would show up here, but it kind of gives us some ideas about what might be happening. Or, or it could be a total uh, red herring suit. That's the other thing with these TV shows. This could be meant entirely just to be misleading. The big question is like, what the heck is going on on this TV show? But uh, episode four is out. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, so don't spoil it if you have. Okay, so that's just another example of an artifact of digital culture, right? It's this thing that exists in this ecosystem of digital culture that's beyond its idea, identity as a TV show. And that's, um, yeah, that's all I want to say about that. So it went over a little bit, but not too bad, hopefully. Um, hopefully that's uh, not, well, actually, yeah, no, we're good. How long is, when did I get started? Does this go to two, it's 250 to, when is this class supposed to end? <laughs> is it 340 or 330? I don't know, let me look this up real quick. If there's someone else, you may know. Off the top of your head. Is it 3.40? Okay, good. So I'm not keeping you too long. That's, that's good to know. Yeah, it was, only, it was not my intent to go too long. All right, thanks, Gene. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Watch WandaVision if you have Disney+. Plus. Uh, but it's an example of, uh, again, digital, an artifact of digital culture. Um, all right, well, I am going to wrap it up there. I'm out of things to say, and I need to uh, go get a drink because my uh, throat is sore from all this talking. Um, but yeah, no homework for the weekends. Again, I'm going to be presenting things much more concretely, hopefully on Monday, and get you started working on your first not first. <laughs> um, I almost said, so I keep going back and forth between mode, between node and module, and I almost said nodule, which is sort of not not the right thing that I want to say. So anyway, uh, I'm going to wrap it up, but I'll, I'll stay online for a little bit if you have any questions. But I'm going to uh, shut off the stream momentarily. Um, thanks for watching, everyone, and hope you have a good weekend. Hopefully. I mean, it would be nice to get some snow, but hopefully it's not like too much of a disruption to people moving in and doing other things. All right, so I'm going to stop the stream. See you later.